Hello, my name is Colin Lowe and this is one in a series of videos on the trump cards in the tarot, mostly from the perspective of their origins during the Italian Renaissance. Today I'll be talking about the death trump. Now those of you who are familiar with the tarot and use tarot for readings will know that the death trump does not typically mean death. It's normally interpreted as meaning change, as in one circumstance sweeping away another. There are occasions, and this might be one of them, where you have death flanked by the nine and ten of swords and somewhere in the background you have the blasted tower. That might give rise to a, a moment of apprehension, but on the whole the death trump is not normally interpreted as meaning death. During the Italian Renaissance, the period of time in which the tarot trumps were first created, the situation was different. The allegorical image of death, which is to say typically a skeleton, often with a scythe, often riding a horse, was well known in popular culture. The death card really did mean death. This is what I want to discuss, the several ways in which an allegorical image of death appears in the popular culture of the time and how it seems to fit in to a larger story and how it connects to the tarot. This is what I'll be talking about. Firstly, the description of the fourth horseman from the book of Revelation. Secondly, an encounter with death, a quaint medieval tale called Three Living, Three Dead. Thirdly, another encounter with, with death, known as the Dance of Death or the Dance Macabre. Fourthly, what I call the Grand Narrative, how the allegorical image of death seems to fit in to a larger story. And lastly, how it all fits together, how it would seem to relate to several of the tarot trumps. I'm going to begin by discussing and showing you an image made by the Renaissance artist Albrecht Dürer as part of a series of images he made for the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the final book in the Christian New Testament. The woodcut shows the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which are war, conquest, famine and death. I'd like you to focus on the figure of death in the lower left corner. These are the words that describe this figure of death. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. The image of death on a pale horse became something of an artistic genre, almost a cliché over the centuries. When the author Terry Pratchett included a comic caricature of death in his Discworld novels, he went to the source, Death on a Pale Horse. The horse is called Binky. So, what is this book of Revelation? It might be one of the most influential books ever written. It's the final text or document in the New Testament of the Christian Bible. And it claims to have been written on a small island off the coast of Turkey by a man named John. It is, for the most part, a theophany, which is to say, John claims to have seen a vision of the divine throne, 
surrounded by saints and other creatures. And it depicts events which are happening in heaven, events which will be mirrored in this world. It's filled with the most extravagant metaphors and images, um, things that have resonated through the ages, things like the Antichrist, the Mark of the Beast, the Book of the Seven Seals, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, uh, the Number of the Beast, the Whore of Babylon, and so on. In essence, it, des it describes the end of the world as we know it. The world as we know it is filled with corrupt and evil powers and according to the book of Revelation there will be an end time in which all of these corrupt and evil powers will be swept away for all time and put down to hell and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. It's a compelling vision. Did it influence the tarot? Undoubtedly. Anyway, uh, let us move on and take a look at a rather quaint medieval story of, it's very short, called Three Living, Three Dead. The medieval story of Three Living, Three Dead is an imagined encounter with death. Three people, usually represented as kings or princes, encounter three corpses. Sometimes the corpses speak and say, soon you will be like us. It is an odd story because it appears to have so little content, but as you will see, we can unpack it. There is a particularly splendid example of three living, three dead that forms part of a series of vast murals in the Campo Santo in Pisa, only a few yards from the famous Leaning Tower. A hunting party of nobles encounters three corpses. A hermit provides moral insight, and we know what he's saying because he's holding the medieval equivalent of a speech bubble. They didn't have speech bubbles, so they had to hold manuscripts. This is what the hermit has to say. If your mind is wide open and you look hard here, your vain glory will be defeated and you'll see your pride dead and you will find the same end. Now observe the law that is written here. In other words, your worldly status is transitory. It will pass away. Your fancy clothes and titles are not going to save you from ending up like these corpses. As we will discover, the tale of three living, three dead is a moral tale implicitly connected to a Christian worldview. For your amusement, or amazement, I have recreated the Pisa mural using tarot cards. Let us now move forward several decades, from the late medieval to the early Renaissance, and we find that the encounter with death takes on a new form, the so-called dance macabre, or the dance of death. Why limit ourselves to three living, three dead? Why not have everyone? The Dance of Death, or Dance Macabre, appeared during the first quarter of the 15th century in the Cemetery of the Holy Innocents in Paris. The idea was copied in several major cities, such as London. If you can imagine the cemetery as a walled enclosure, perhaps with a cloister, then around the wall one could paint a mural, an extended linear wall painting showing all the social classes ordered by rank, and all dancing with death. It would begin with the Pope and the Emperor, and proceed through the ranks of the nobility, clergy, magistrates, merchants, soldiers, artisans, and so on, ending with vagabonds and fools. The original mural in Paris was destroyed in the 17th century, or possibly the 18th, I can't remember, but the designs were copied and published during the late Renaissance. You can see examples here. The format for a page was a woodcut, based on the images in the cemetery, and underneath there were verses spoken by death, and verses spoken by the soon-to-be-deceased. There are some dozens of these figures. 
The images are beautifully executed and show the strict social hierarchy and characteristic dress of the early 15th century. Here we have the Pope and the Emperor, instantly recognisable in the Marseille tarot produced 200 years later. Here we have a Queen and a Duchess. Here, a member of the clergy and a wandering friar or hermit. Here we have a man-at-arms next to a fool. Here, a gossip next to, surprise, surprise, a female fool. Yes, there really were women playing the fool. The notion behind the dance of death is that we're all dancing with death and perhaps we have forgotten or don't realise it. But at some point the music is going to stop and death will lead us from the dance floor. The focus on social hierarchy is interesting. I believe there is a, a remnant of it in the trump suit of 22 cards. It's not very obvious now, but uh, it certainly is obvious in the so-called tarot of Mantegna, which is not a true tarot. There's no evidence it was ever used for game playing. But that certainly does have a, a social hierarchy of ten classes. The definitive form of the dance macabre can be found in a series of small woodcuts made by the artist Hans Holbein and published somewhat later in Lyon in about 1530, about a century after the dance first appeared in Paris. You can find modern reproductions such as this Penguin edition. The basic premise is retained. The various classes in society encounter death. But this is no longer a gentle or stately dance. The knight fights back against his fatal adversary. This is a final encounter, wrenching a person out of life. The nun is dragged away, the peddler taken while travelling. The astrologer does not foresee his own death. Death drives the farmer's oxen, and here death is playing with the fool. This version of the dance became popular and has been re reproduced and expanded many times. It is an attractive format, a dramatic woodcut showing the intervention of death during daily life, accompanied by moralistic verses. So what is the big picture? Why this fixation with death? Why were people in the 15th and 16th centuries reminded so vividly of their mortality? Why the moralistic verses? We live in a, a very different age and the answer may be obvious to some and completely obscure to others. The primary narrative of Christianity is that of death and resurrection. There is life before death, there's life after death. There is resurrection, there's a day of judgment, and there is the execution of divine justice. This is very clearly described in the parable of the sheep and goats in the Gospel of Matthew. And remember, these are words that are attributed to Jesus himself. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd sh separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right, and the goats on his left. And a little later it says, then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This event, the separation of the righteous from the wicked, was portrayed by artists all over Europe. This depiction can be found in the Convento 
di San Marco in Florence and it's by the famous artist Fra Angelico. This depiction is in the Camposanto in Pisa. In both cases you can see that it depicts the separation of the righteous from the wicked. The book of Revelation, despite its length and intricacy and vividness, is essentially describing this same event, but in glorious technicolour and fabulous Dolby sound. Now let us look at the tarot. You're all going to die. The dead will be raised. Divine justice, the separation of sheep from goats. Note that in many older packs this card was placed towards the end of the trumps next to judgment. The foolish go to hell. The righteous go to heaven. This picture is what I call the grand narrative of the Middle Ages. Let me try and unpack this diagram. The top row with the fool on the left and the hermit on the right represents society. Society in the late Middle Ages and Renaissance was torn between two opposed ideals. On one hand, the pursuit of power, influence, status and wealth. On the other hand, there was the pursuit of holiness. The cards between the fool and the hermit show an increase in worldly status, with love or good marriage trumping power and fame or celebrity trumping love. The hermit trumps them all. The church itself was divided between the fabulous, almost unbelievable wealth of the Pope and the Cardinals and the grassroots popularity of various monastic orders such as the Franciscans and mendicant orders of friars who sought to emulate the poverty, the charity and the humility of Jesus and his disciples. A strain of social criticism at the time, which I will talk about in another talk, um, depicted the quest for status, power, influence um, and wealth as essentially foolish. And society itself was depicted as a ship of fools. Returning to the picture, you can see that the hermit and the fool are opposed, folly opposed to wisdom. Below the hermit you can see the virtues, of which only three are present in the tarot deck of 22 trumps, although there are other decks such as the Minkiet tarot with all seven virtues. The fool and hermit can be taken to represent the goats and the sheep. Following death, they will be raised from the tomb and judged. The foolish, those who disregarded Christ's teachings, will be condemned to hell. The righteous will inhabit a new heaven and a new earth, as promised in the book of Revelation, which I have indicated by the world card. You can see that a substantial number of tarot trumps appear in this diagram. It's not an explanation for the tarot, but it does show how closely aligned many of the trumps were with the popular culture of the time. Anyway, that's it. I'm done. If you made it this far and you enjoyed it, please give me the thumbs up. Uh, I will be making a number of videos in the same vein, videos on the tarot trump, so if you want to see them and you're not already subscribed, then please subscribe. Anyway, that's it. So, best wishes.